Welcome to the course Environmental Impact Assessments and in today's session we are going to cover resource efficiency um, and we're going to look at what methods we adopt uh, within this uh, within the umbrella of EIA. So uh, the key reference for us for this is like from our uh, text course book which we are following is chapter 17 which deals with resource efficiency. So our coverage for today would include that we are going to look at uh, the definitions and concepts of resource efficiencies where we'll uh, look at some of the uh, models which are their life cycle assessment, then energy and mass balance concept we'll try to understand and then we'll also try to understand what's closed loop systems and then what's waste hierarchy, self-sufficiency and re resilience concept. Further, we'll look into what really we look into while we undertake scoping and baseline studies pertaining to resource efficiency. Further, we'll look into how we undertake impact prediction and evaluation while uh, dealing with this domain. Further, we'll look into the mitigation measures which are available in this domain uh, in a very brief manner. And then we'll look at some of the resource efficiency indicators. So accordingly, the learning outcomes, expected learning outcomes um, are that after completion of this particular session, you should be able to define all the concepts related with resource efficiency. Further, you should be able to identify various uh, purpose and steps involved in scoping and baseline studies. And you should be able to identify ways, approach to deal with impact prediction and evaluation and then how you would deal with mitigation, you would uh, conceptually explain that and then also tell the steps involved in that or certain uh, methods involved in that. Further, you should uh, be able to identify and list some of the resource efficiency indicators. So understanding resource efficiency, uh, it deals with how carefully resources are used and uh, what kind of waste are generated in the process and how do you really manage that. And uh, you look at it at all the stages of the project from project construction to operation till the project is decommissioned or pulled down. So. Um, Usually, uh, if you'll see this resource efficiency, it's not really uh, taken separately, separate section in EIA, but it's very well integrated in the EIA process. But uh, at the international level, this uh, practice is now changing with IFC uh, Performance Standard 3, uh, uh, suggesting for resource efficiency and pollution prevention in its uh, uh, standards guidelines. So looking into the definitions and concepts involved, we see resource efficiency, what does that really mean? So uh, it looks into the measures of input and measures of output and measures of waste. So measures of input, like what resources it's consuming for uh, various stages and the stages of construction and the stages of operation and decommissioning. So how much resource it's consuming. Then you also look into, you measure what, how much waste is generated in the proposed development. And this again, you look at every stage, how much waste you're generating at the time of construction, what waste you're generating at the time of operation and when the project is pulled down. So you look into like a resource, if we talk about, you look into how much energy it's consuming, how much water it's consuming and any raw material what it's using. So how much consumption is there? So you measure that input and you also measure that waste, which is uh, generated out of your project. So uh, another concept uh, and a key way of looking into it is life cycle assessment. Um, what does life, assess, life cycle assessment means that you look into how, how is the life uh, of the product uh, of the product in terms of uh, how it is consuming energy and how it's uh, how it's uh, releasing what kind of waste are re releasing and then within this you also see the concept of upstream impact and downstream impact 
So uh, upstream impact uh, would mean that uh, where and how the material uh, is produced and uh, how it is produced, how it is processed and how it is manufactured and how it is packaged and how it is transported and uh, how it is used. So that's upstream uh, impact of the project, what we say. And then there is downstream impact, like it, it deals with mostly the residual, the waste which is generated and how the resulting waste are managed. How do you recycle it, reuse it, uh, or you uh, ultimately take it to the landfill site or you generate energy with that. So uh, how, how the waste out of your project is dealt with that deals with the downstream impact. So we have seen upstream impact and downstream impact related with the life cycle assessment. So here in the diagram, you can see the upstream and downstream, and you can look at the product life cycle here. And looking at the product life cycle, you see the material which is which comes and then how it is processed, manufactured, and it's uh, packaged, transported, and then it is put to use, and then eventually it is disposed. And then all the process till it is disposed, it is said to be upstream if you want to see diagrammatically. And then after it is disposed, how do we reuse, recycle and make it as a material again is seen as a downstream. So the purpose uh, here when we deal with resource efficiency is to minimize the use of input and also minimize uh, how much waste is generated. So uh, when we look at life cycle assessments, we measure the environmental impact of the product or the services. So that is what we do. And life cycle assessment, in particularly in uh, context of EIA, is considered the amount of resources that is used for diff at the different stages of a product or a proje uh, project. So for example, uh, uh, like, uh, Oh, what do you really choose to use, the, the typology itself and to what quantity you want to use. So uh, if you use steel compared to alternative building materials such as bricks or concrete, so you will see that a steel has larger embodied energy than the alternative material. So uh, that way it's less resource efficient compared to the alternative materials here. So that is what uh, the assessment is done when we look at the life cycle assessment. So here again, uh, there's a handbook which you can see life cycle assessment handbook by Curran. Uh, you can see here. So I have, uh, you, you can look at this particular handbook which should be available. And uh, there are a lot of standards and guidelines which are available to undertake the life cycle assessment. So international standards are available, technical reports are available, I've just snipped the lists for you. And uh, uh, it is said that life cycle assessment is technically very complex subject and, uh, and uh, like uh, you, you can see this handbook available for further guidance in that. Looking at the general methodology which is adopted for this purpose, the kind of framework which is adopted for this, you can look at this diagram, you can see uh, taken from the Corinth's book, uh, you can see the life cycle assessment framework. So you first look at the goal and scope and uh, the definition of it and then you have intensive inventory analysis and then you assess the impact. And then inventory analysis, at all these stages, there will be interpretation. And then you will be looking at the direct applications like product development and improvement. How do you improve the product? How do you strategically undertake planning? And then how do you uh, take connected with the public policy? How do you do marketing and then the other aspects? So the, all the policy aspects, if you remember, all the tools we had talked about. So uh, that's how the life cycle assessment framework is taken care of in a very broad manner. And here in this example, you can see the general life cycle flow, flow diagram. Um, here you can see the how the raw material is acquired and even when the raw material is acquired, there's certain consumption of energy and then at that stage itself, the waste is produced. 
and then the material when it is uh, manufactured after acquiring the raw material again the um, energy is consumed in the manufacturing process and then the waste is generated likewise you see the product manufacture when the all the raw materials come together and the product is manufactured again you have energy consumption and the waste is there and then when the product is used or consumed um, like uh, energy is again consumed at that stage and then you might also find waste and then when the uh, material is uh, no more usable then you finally dispose that and then at that disposition also you uh, can uh, you um, consume energy and then uh, even that produces waste and that waste can be reused or recycled. So that is how you see the general life cycle uh, flow diagram. So think of uh, like a very simplistic manner you can think of the television uh, television manufacturing how the raw material is coming for that what basic raw materials are there then the final television is uh, prepared and then how it goes to, for the consumption purpose and when you dispose of your television how does how, how do you dispose it and how it is recycled or so on so you can think of a computer as well or any any material with which you deal with so that that would uh, allow you to think of the general life cycle of uh, of the product Again, here in the diagram, you can see the assessment of uh, resource performance of buildings. Um, and this is again adopted from the um, British standard. And here you can see how they're looking at the building life cycle and uh, looking at the resources, how the resource is being consumed at all the stages. So you can see at the product stage, raw material supply, transport, manufacturing, and then the construction stage, transport, construction, installation process. Also, it's the use stage, how you're using uh, use, maintenance, repair, replacement, and end of the life stage where you have deconstruction, demolition, transport, waste processing, and then post project where you're recycling, recovering, uh, reusing all, all the materials. So that what you can see here. So uh, that was about the life cycle assessment. Now come uh, familiarizing ourselves with the other concepts. That's energy and mass balance. So um, this is an important component when we deal with resource efficiency. And uh, when we talk about energy and mass balance, it means the uh, sum of mass going into a system like the total energy getting into the system must be equal to what is coming out of the system. So th there should be a mass balance and that sum of energy uh, which goes into the system must equal to the energy which is going out plus the changes in the composition of that system. So it might be either input and output are equal or there might be input and plus some changes in the system and the output. So that uh, equates to energy balance. And uh, we, uh, in the process of assessment, we ensure that all these inputs and outputs are accounted for. So you take care of all these aspects when you uh, deal with it. So here in the image, you can uh, see from the example, like how all the resources have been taken care of uh, at various stages and how uh, the input output has been accounted for and how what kind of input is going how and none of the arrows are left uh, hanging in the system. So another uh, example you can see here how the balance is checked how the what kind of resources have been put into the system and what kind of output they are getting it from the system. So you can see these examples. So looking at another concept, you see waste hierarchy and uh, which looks into self-sufficiency and resilience. So looking at waste hierarchy, so waste hierarchy, the concept is like how do you really handle waste? So the first idea of handling waste is to reduce 
the amount of waste which is produced. So you try to reduce uh, reduction, R for reduction, and then you see how you can reuse the material, the, uh, whatever waste has been produced, how do you reuse those material, and then uh, you further look into how you can recycle them into a new product. So how out of all the waste, new product can be created, and then if not, if all of these cannot be done or after that also one can uh, recover the energy from the waste. So whatever is the waste, finally you can convert it into energy. And then after all these things, reduction, reuse, recycle, recovery for energy, once you have done that, then the waste can be sent to the landfill site as a residual remaining waste. So that's about the waste hierarchy. Now, looking at the self-sufficiency and resilience. So uh, what is that? So um, 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 when we look at self-sufficiency and resilience, um, it, it, uh, uh, the system allows uh, more output uh, to be achieved uh, in the given amount of input. So how you can have system sufficiency, so uh, how you can, um, by whatever input has been getting, uh, is been given, uh, you are uh, trying to maximize the output from that particular input. So you see example include LED light bulbs, which uh, allow more, many more lumens uh, per watt than the traditional incandescent bulbs. So how efficiently you can use it. So process improvement, so all those deal with self-sufficiency and resilience. Uh, as well as uh, in the case of settlement also, you are seeing that these days high density is being much more uh, promoted given uh, the understanding that it allows uh, resource efficiency in terms of how much energy is consumed, how much energy is shared, so which leads to economical use of those resources. So that was about the definitions and concepts. Now moving on, we'll look at the scoping and baseline studies. So the uh, purpose of scoping and baseline study is that you identify which issues uh, relating to resource efficiencies are important uh, for the project planning and important for the decision making. So you identify the important issues here. So uh, in this stage, you have possible questions which you look into. So while dealing with material, you look into like uh, um, uh, uh, whether the project uh, uh, will use uh, uh, what material which the project is going to use. Is it uh, very limited? Um, limited uh, and uh, uh, is it a uh, scarce resource? And at what stage you're going to use it? To what quantity you're going to use it? And then um, and whether you're going to use any harmful material and do you need to handle it in a very sp special way. So you need to look at all those aspects here. And, uh, and then you will also look at, uh, uh, once you understand the resources, you would also look at the impact it might have on the uh, environment. So will that particular usage of the material would lead to uh, like, what? how much quantity of material do you need and uh, how it uh, it is going to impact the project. So that all you need to see here. And then uh, further, similarly, the material and the resources in terms of land. So how much land you're going to use? Uh, is it uh, suitable, the land is suitable for the purpose or not? And how much, uh, like when you're looking at the impact, how much foot print uh, uh, you are occupying for the pro particular project and uh, whether uh, what kind of land you have taken for that purpose. So likewise you will look into energy uh, like uh, uh, how, what kind type of energy you are uh, producing in the given context and how you are using whether it's renewable energy or not and then um, whatever energy you're going to use, whether you'll be able to get it from the available infrastructure or you would need additional infrastructure for that. And uh, whatever you're consuming, uh, uh, is the system, existing system resilient to uh, take care of that uh, requirement of yours? Can that uh, take it or not? So all these aspects, like you would be looking at water, then raising similar questions uh, like, uh, 
uh, are you building a project in the uh, water scarce area or you have the capacity to take care of that, uh, fulfill that requirement and then is the water uh, infrastructure resilient in your context or not. So likewise you look for the waste and likewise you will look for the uh, all the other aspects. So there's another example which we see here. I have taken it from uh, EU guidance on environmental impact assessment. So you can see, like I said, uh, rarely it is segregated as a, a separate section. It's very much inbuilt. So I've uh, snipped a checklist from the EU document, which uh, it within itself allows you how during the scoping stage, you can um, undertake uh, uh, the resource assessment. So you can see the point number two, will construction or operation of the phase use natural resource such as land, water, material or energy, especially any resource which are non-renewable or are in short supply. So you see how they are looking at the resource efficiency and also looking at the availability of the resource. So the uh, checklist questions like land, especially un undeveloped or agricultural land, what's the scenario with water, and what's the scenario with mineral aggregates, uh, whether it's yes or no, and then giving it in a descriptive format, what's the characteristic of the project environment would, uh, would, uh, could be affected and how, and is the effect likely to be significant? Why? So in the checklist method, you're also checking the significance of that particular observations you're making. So likewise, you will be looking at the forest and timber energy, including electricity and fuels and any other resources which you're using for the purpose. Further from the same checklist, I have taken how they're dealing with the solid waste during the construction or operation or decommissioning uh, stage. So you can see the spoil, overburden or mines, mine waste, municipal waste, hazardous or toxic waste. Um, other industrial process, surplus products, seaweed, sludge, construction or demolition waste, redundant machinery or equipment, contaminant soils or other material, agriculture waste, any other solid waste. So for all these, you look whether you will be using yes or no, what would be the characteristic of the project environments, will it be affected or not, and then what would be the significance of it. So this, these kind of checklists are used at the scoping stage to look at the resource efficiency. This example is the inbuilt checklist. The previous one you saw was like a specific uh, checklist or it, that can also be integrated with the main EIA report. Other I have taken from resource efficiency best practice checklist. I've also given you the link so that you can download this checklist. So here again, you can see how they have prepared a checklist where they look at the energy of water and then whether uh, oh, the specific details about that, uh, whether it's going to reduce your energy bills or not, what kind typology is there and um, whether you're choosing low carbon heating and uh, are you going to generate your own power, then how you're going to measure your water use and uh, what are the installations you're doing for saving water. So all those kind of checklists are there. So that was about the scoping and baseline studies. So those things are available and I've also given the link to all those examples there. Now moving on, we'll look at the impact prediction and evaluation. So part of it we also saw in the checklist method how they were looking at the significance of the impact which might happen. So now uh, in this particular stage, you identify issues uh, significant with respect to project environmental impact. So whether whatever impact you have identified in the scoping stage, you'll try to look at the significance of that impact. And in this stage, you make a detailed prediction what will really happen. You further put it in the detailed study and you look at the significance of the kind of change which will happen. And uh, you also look at whether whatever kind of changes are happening will that need uh, mitigation measures or not. So um, the examples of how you would look into it include that uh, what would be the quantity of material resources consumed um, and you would be looking at the details of its typology and for uh, every project stage you would be looking at. 
and then you would be looking at from where the material is coming from uh, whatever resource you're using from where it is coming and then you will be also looking at uh, what kind of impact of any material uh, would have on your project site or the environment. So that all you'll be looking as you also saw in the checklist. So that would help you in uh, assessment of the significance here. So uh, like wise, for the detailed understanding of the material, you might be looking into re various resources like you might be looking at the land resources and you have already studied how to evaluate land resources. But here what you are also doing is quantifying and also looking at it from the resource efficiency point of view. So the detailed pattern you know, aware about, but uh, the how you're going to use it in this context, that is what you want to learn here. And then you have to be careful whether these resources are scarce in that particular area, wherever your project is coming up. And then similarly, you will look at the energy, the quantity of energy used for the proposed project. And you have to also look at not just the quantity, but the, the type of energy. Uh, what type of energy you're using, whether it's renewable energy format or form or not, and at what stages you're using so that you are careful that if it's only for a shorter duration, it might be acceptable. But if it's in the operational stage and it is continuously demand, you might have to look for that. And uh, there's another term when you deal with all the resources is the load profile. So uh, looking at what this load profile mean is the energy needed over time, like how much energy will need in days, weeks, and year. So you also need to identify the load profile. So what's the load profile of your project at every stage, at the construction stage, at the operational stage, and the decommissioning stage? So you need to quantify and look at it. And uh, uh, you may also familiarize yourself with the embodied energy term. So uh, here, uh, how much energy is being consumed uh, by that particular product would be embodied energy. And then for the, uh, for the project, uh, any, every stage you have to look at how much embodied energy is, uh, is really coming up for that particular stage in your project. So likewise, you'll be looking at water, the quantity of water used by the, uh, of your, from used by your project and uh, what kind of emergency services, what all, how the water will be used and how it will be used in the waste stage also. And then you here again, you will look at the load profile and you will ca calculate this as, as per the data which is available to you. And you will also look at various sources of water from where you're using it and uh, look at what's the um, capacity of the existing infrastructure to give you uh, water resource for your particular purpose. And uh, you need to check whether it's in the res resource scarce area. And similarly, you look at the waste, the quantity of waste, what will be generated by your project, and at what stage it will be pro produced, and then uh, where the waste will go, whether you have the capacity of the area to absorb those wastes or in, do you have infrastructure to take care of those wastes. So those things have to be seen here. And you might be, uh, also you might reflect upon that all the stages might have different level of impact on the environment. So uh, usually the construction stage might have extensive impact, negative impact. Even the demolition stage might also have major uh, impact by the way it generates waste. So you can also look at varying degree of impact at various stages. So here in this example, we look at uh, the uh, example of uh, airport as given in the book. Uh, we look at the example of airports from Australia, uh, Western Sydney, and how they are documenting their material. So uh, material consumed during the construction of the uh, Sydney airport in terms of tons they have recorded. So you look at uh, during the earthwork, how much water they're consuming, and then what's the potential source, and then they have also quantified it. Likewise, you'll see how much asphalt they have uh, used, and then in terms of tons, uh, and then you also see the potential uh, resources from where they are getting it. So even uh, a local uh, 
a resource would also save a lot of energy. And then likewise, you see how they are using concrete, how they are using machinery for operation. So uh, you can um, uh, look at this example, how the documentation goes on. And then there's another example from um, a uh, pipeline project. Uh, you can see here uh, how they are adopting it, waste, uh, how they are dealing with the waste. So what's the waste code? What's the typology it, of it? What's the description from where the source is coming? What's the quantity of the source? And then potential management, how they're going to handle it and what are kind of facilities they have. So similarly, you can see another example of where they are using, uh, documenting the embodied energy so that they could uh, understand the resource efficiency well. So uh, you can see here how with material and uh, each material, how is the energy, embodied energy, and how it is uh, taken care of in various country context. So uh, I have just uh, snipped another uh, life cycle impact assessment for you from the uh, life cycle assessment handbook. So you, you can see what's, uh, what, what's the process involved. And like you see the what kind of mandatory elements are there. So selection of impact categories, category indicator, categorization of the models you're going to use, uh, and then assignment of uh, life cycle impact results. Well, how do you classify them? You look at their significance at that time. And then calculation of category indicator results. So how you're going to um, see the indicator based on the classification and then um, Based on that, how do you group and weight it? So we did discuss about grouping and weighting. So when you classify that and then you see whether it's falling under the very high impact or low impact and what weightage you give to each of those kind of uh, impact which are happening. So that was about uh, the prediction. Now moving on to mitigation aspect. So uh, resource efficiency uh, is said to be best handled in the initial stage of EIA. And uh, uh, especially when you are dealing with all the alternatives like where the project should be located, where the resource efficiency can be uh, um, made at its best. And then also when you're dealing with the design, what materials to deal with, how the technology would be there. So, at, uh, so th that's the level where you really handle the resource efficiency. So uh, uh, while you're doing it uh, as, a, uh, as a developer or the project designer, you need to look at uh, how, uh, like what materials you're using and can there be uh, like less material, uh, can you achieve efficiency, sufficiency or not, uh, that you need to look at and uh, whether the project could use less land, so all the resources, can you work in the lesser land? Can you work in a more energy efficient uh, manner by the use of technology? Uh, can you use materials which are less, um, have lesser embodied energy? And then uh, how do you handle the waste product? And how do you look at the um, water efficient technology and how do you have uh, the various techniques to recycle the resources, the water resource, the waste, uh, all that you need to look at. So uh, at when you're doing the mitigation, you need to see all these, again, all the concepts, what you saw, how, how you're taking care of all those things. So when you improve technology, you can maximize the efficiency of the resource and you can also minimize the pollution. So all, all the concepts of uh, reuse, recycle, uh, all that would come here in your mitigation measure. So now looking at, uh, so that was uh, very briefly on the mitigation point. Uh, now moving on to resource efficiency indicator. So uh, here I have taken this from assessment of resource efficiency indicators and targets. So that they, I have given you the link, you can download how it gives you a complete idea about various concepts and all the indicator and then also how you take care of it, uh, resource efficiency part here. So uh, you see that we, in the initial week, uh, first week of our lecture, we looked at the environmental status. So while we were de dealing with the environmental status, we had all the global targets. So resource efficiency also helps us to connect with the global targets. So here you can see that how they have greenhouse 
uh, gas emissions on top and how data reduce intend to reduce by 20 to 30 percent by 2020 80 to 95 percent by 2050 and then how it is translating into the use of efficient uh, resource usage so water usage actual land use so all, all that how how they are looking at the domestic material consumption at different context level so uh, through biomass consumption mineral consumption fossil fuel metal consumption nuclear energy all that you can see how it is being dealt with and then uh, they also have come up with a dpsir framework so which is the uh, driver's pressure state impact and response framework so we have studied about driver's pressures and state. So uh, th there's this framework which uh, uh, in this you try to analyze what are the key drivers of the resources which you're going to use and then the type of pressures exerted because of what kind of uh, resource you're going to use, what kind of pressure will be exerted on the natural resource and the natural environment throughout the life cycle of these uh, of uh, the product stages and then what's the state of the ecosystem in which you are dealing with uh, whether it is stre already stressed or it has scope for uh, further development that also you need to look into and then what kind of impact it will have and then what kind of response uh, it will have in return and then what kind of uh, policy interventions you're going to take uh, improve in terms of productivity and then how you're going to deal with specific impacts. So the, the, it also provides you the DP SIR framework, how to deal with this, how to understand with this. And then you are, or you also have this uh, particular uh, resource. Uh, the uh, report also gives you the um, indicators. So you have resource productivity indicator and looking at what is this uh, resource productivity indicators are um, derived from relationship between drivers and pressures so like water and uh, water is the water and what is the water consumption per capita so uh, that is what you look at water consumption per capita when you're looking at resource productivity indicators and then you have resource specific impact so uh, this is another term which is used so uh, this you can calculate based on the relationship between pressure and impacts so example greenhouse gas emissions per unit of primary energy supply so uh, at as per the energy supply how much is the greenhouse gas emission so this uh, this will help you to understand resource specific impact so what resource you're using and what kind of impact it will have so here you can see again resource efficiency indicator indicate uh, you have uh, uh, they uh, they have developed a thematic strategy on sustainable use of natural resource uh, where you have three types of indicators uh, which are used for measuring resource efficiency so you can see indicators to measure the productivity of the use of resources like re uh, resource productivity in terms of uh, uh, what uh, economic value we give to per kg and then indicated to evaluate the environmental impact of the use of specific resources then you have indicators to measure progress in reducing the ecological stress of resource use like uh, cost per impact okay so you look at that eco efficiency how do you attain that so you, you see that three indicators categories uh, which are used uh, to measure resource efficiency you see the socio-economic benefits environmental impacts and resource use how they have been uh, used at your place further this report also gives you a list of indicators which are used for uh, evaluation purpose so again you can see the category material energy and greenhouse gas emission water land and soil response indicators so you can see resource issues uh, resource what has been used under material the range of resources and then how you use the indicator so there are certain examples of indicator here like domestic material consumption absolute per capita raw material consumption like whatever absolute per capita environmental weight consumption EMC 
overall environmental impacts indicator then for the biomass also you have similarly you can see for the metal also recovery use recycle rates of specific metals so all those uh, indicators are given which might help you how to look at how efficiently those resources are used and then you can look at another example here taken from the same report so evaluation of indicators so how do you evaluate those indicators so um, you might be looking at uh, all, all these like how it uh, all the resource category and what issues you're dealing with and then what is the indicator as you saw in the previous table and then how you're going to take care of it like through the policy support or sensitiveness or rebound effects or uh, past trends, future trends, early warnings, how you're going to handle that. And then you can see the um, in this example how they are uh, looking at the uh, resource efficiency, the green criteria completely fulfilled uh, within the policy support, uh, within the sensitiveness. So all the green would show the matrix you can prepare. Orange criteria partially fulfilled, criteria not fulfilled, so all those red areas. So this is how you can even depict your uh, findings for the resource efficiency. And uh, you also have uh, resource use uh, relevant indicators, basket of resource use uh, indicators. So you see material use, energy use, water use, land use. And then um, in terms of uh, resource use, you look at the domestic resource use, global dom global resource demand you look at that and then kind of uh, Im environmental impact which it might have at the domestic level and at the global level so you look at these metrics here so you look at the material and domestic resource use domestic material consumption how it is so uh, by these standards and your um, contextual commitment as per the country commitment you can look at that what's the raw material consumption rates and so on and what's the energy footprint, what's the water footprint, what's the actual land demand, land footprints, and so on for resource oriented. So uh, there's uh, another guideline which is available for the purpose, environmental impact assessment of the project. I have given you the link. Here also you can see they have inbuilt and under, uh, like try to handle this, uh, point number one, point three, point five. Uh, where you look at impact related to use of natural resources. So there they have dealt with it. There's another report which you can refer to, life cycle indicators for resources, product and waste. Here again, you can look at environmental impacts and areas of protection by resource and contributors. So you again see raw materials, space, environmental media, flow resources, how those resources are there, individual contributors accounted, from where that is coming and then what kind of consumption is there um, and what kind of impact is there and what kind of intervention has to be taken for the protection. So that you, you can see there's another report which is available which you can refer. Land and ecosystem accounts for Europe towards geospatial environmental accounting. So that's it. Uh, so summarizing what we covered today. So we looked at uh, the definitions and concepts of resource efficiency, where we familiarize ourselves with different concepts. And then we looked at what we really undertake during the scoping and baseline studies. And then we looked at impact prediction and evaluation, for which we also looked at uh, several other guidelines and examples which are there at the later part. Then we also looked at well, what we really do in the mitigation, and these are very much aligned with the definition and concepts which you learned. So that fits into the mitigation aspect. And then we looked at resource efficiency indicators, uh, like what all indicators are used um, in the process in the domain. So that was all for today, and these were the references which we used for this particular session. And uh, further, you can look into all these reports. Uh, the links have been provided to you. And um, winding up, please feel free to ask questions. Let us know about any concerns you have. Do share your opinions, experiences, and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring AI. Thank you.